Hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy. I'm your host for today, and I want to talk about some recent events. Now, we normally don't do recent events. Kind of my goal here is in creating this show is to create an evergreen set of security knowledge and reference that you can look at a week, a month, even a year or two later and still find it's mostly valuable. In this particular case, though, there are some long-term lessons learned. So if you'll indulge me, if you're listening to it right now, it's probably top of mind. And if you're listening to it weeks or months later, there's some good stuff in here. So, of course, I'm talking about the recent attacks that have taken place on casinos. Last month, Caesars reported they were hit by a ransomware attack, but there didn't seem to be a lot of operational impact. Uh, This month, just fairly recently, MGM reported a widespread outage due to ransomware attack. And it seems that the attackers have, well, basically found a way to improve their odds when playing at the casinos. Now, these are different threat actors, potentially. Again, they're not really filing reports, but the Scattered Spider, also known as UNC3944 for Caesars, is considered to be the actor there. And Black Cat, aka Alfie for MGM, and both appear to be in operation for a number of years, at least four years, based upon open source intelligence. And that's a long time in this type of business. Uh, particularly when you're talking about organizations that can generate payouts in the seven and eight figure range. So with MGM, what went down? I mean, the reservation systems were down, the hotel key cards, the casino floor, billing systems, and there's probably a lot more that was out as well that was maybe not visible to the average user. At Caesars, it seems to be more of an information compromise that took place in the back room. And so far, we haven't seen any deliberate exposure of that data. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment as to why that might be the case. And note that these really aren't the first casino hacks. Uh, Casino.org lists several from the past few years, including the Venetian and the Palazzo. Back in 2014, Sands' CEO made some nuclear threats against the nation state. And there was a nation state that had some capable cyber offensive capabilities. And so there was a huge destruction that took place in their thing. So again, be careful about public statements, particularly from your executives, if they're also designed to kind of be inflammatory. That's not always a good idea to quote unquote poke the bear. And I give you a hint, it wasn't the bear if you know about that from our terminology with respect to ransomware and malware groups. Uh, MGM had been hacked previously in 2019 and the potential information compromised there up to some estimates, 30 million guests. And there's probably several other hacks that we'll never know about. And the new SEC ruling that I discussed in detail in episode 146, living in a materiality world, will mean we're probably going to hear a lot more frequently from those organizations on Las Vegas Boulevard. So what happened? I mean, I presume you're familiar with most of the high-level information, so I am not going to get into the details in the show here. But I do want to talk about what we can learn from organizations that take security at least as seriously as you do and I do. And, And as we say, there for the grace of God go I. So let's dig in. After a quick word from our sponsor, Risk 360 is a cybersecurity technology and consulting firm that works with high growth technology firms to help leaders build, manage, and certify security, privacy, and compliance program. They publish weekly thought leadership, webinars, and downloadable resources such as their PCI compliance program workbook, a business case for SOC 2, ISO 27001, the path to certification, and many more titles, all available for download at no charge at Risk 360.com slant resources. Let Risk360 help you build your business case to achieve certification compliance at risk3sixty.com slant resource. All right, let's go back to Caesars. And we find out that the new SEC rule change, which I discussed in a prior episode, has resulted now in Caesars, a publicly traded company, issuing an 8K statement. And an 8K statement is a material statement with regard to a publicly traded company and item eight tax zero one under other events. Now it's about a one pager and it looks like it was properly massaged through legal and probably through PR and everything else like that uh, to make it sound as acceptable as possible. See, one of the things Warren Buffett used to say is if you really want to read a financial statement, start with footnotes because it's the stuff they don't want you to see. Well, the SEC ruling has kind of moved that out of the footnotes up into standalone documents. And so what you're going to find is ideally the facts and maybe a little bit of coaching of them, but not a whole lot more detail. If you don't have to disclose it, don't disclose it is probably a good mantra for organizations. And as we heard from 
you know, I said in my prior broadcast, less than 10% of publicly traded companies tend to make these disclosures voluntarily. This, of course, is a new requirement, and we'll see. But let me quote a couple things out of that 8K, because again, it's only a page long. It said, Caesars Entertainment identified suspicious activity in its information technology network resulting from a social engineering attack on an outsourced IT support vendor. But our customer-facing operations have not been impacted by this incident. Continuing down a little bit, said, we determined that the unauthorized actor acquired a copy of, among other data, our loyalty program database, which includes driver's license numbers and our social security numbers for a significant number of those members. We have taken steps to ensure that the stolen data is deleted by the unauthorized actor, although we cannot guarantee this result. I'm going to come back to that statement in a moment. And then the usual, we're going to offer up out of abundance of caution, credit monitoring, et cetera. So we've also taken steps to ensure that the specific outsourced IT support vendor involved in this matter has implemented corrective measures to protect against future attacks that could pose a threat to our systems. Kind of sounds like they didn't get fired. And these costs will be offset by our cybersecurity insurance, but we don't know yet. And so what we find then is that, uh, of course, the end, the trust or value gaps in members is deeply important to us, and we regret any concern or inconvenience this may cause. Okay, so that's a properly worded legal response to what took place. And what we find out then is that that four-day breach notification, they said that as a result of our investigation, they determined on the 7th of September. And so I'm recording this episode several days after that, but not too many days later. And so we find out then is that tightening that up to a four-day notification may cause organizations to hold off on their declaration of an actual breach. You suspect something's going on, but you really don't want to be speculating in publicly filed documents, okay? But the interesting thing that we talked about that I mentioned to come back to is taking steps to ensure the stolen data is deleted by the unauthorized actor although we cannot guarantee this result. Now, how do you do that? And of course, the answer is logically, well, you pay the ransom. And if ransomware operators whom uh, typical security research say, oh, you can't trust them, they're all criminals, uh, they're disreputable, but quite honestly, following through with your contract as a ransomware operator is good for business. Well, why would that be? If we found out that the word on the street is if you get ransomware and you pay it and you get your files back, or your files don't get disclosed because this is no longer an availability attack, it's a confidentiality attack, you're probably more likely to end up paying in the future. If, however, a particular actor chooses not to do it, but just pockets the money and goes, yeah, yeah, well, that's going to reduce the likelihood that future ransomware events are going to work out and result in a payment. I remember when NotPetya came out, my first thought was a bullet was going to be administered in Moscow for somebody who did not actually provide decryption keys. And then we found out later on that that really wasn't a ransomware event at all. The ransomware was just sort of cover for which is just a destructive act. In this particular case, though, we find out that if the actors have taken the money and have held to their end of the bargain, what does that do for the likelihood that future organizations, boards in particular, will get together? And although they might have a publicly facing statement saying, we never negotiate, in fact, if it comes down to your business or your ethics, a lot of times at the executive level, they'll keep the business going and they'll, they'll make a little bend here from that. In addition, unless that particular threat actor is specifically listed in the OFAC as a uh, national entity of interest to the U.S. Department of Treasury, which says you cannot do business with them, and there's some nation states that are labeled and then thousands of entities, even Bitcoin addresses are in that OFAC list. It's kind of fun reading something. But what you'll find then is that if that's not the case, then you have really no legal prohibition against paying the ransom. Often you get negotiators involved. A few friends who run security companies and they get front and center in that. And they get to the point where they almost know the personalities of the people on the other end of the negotiation. They're not face to face. They're going to be in some chat room or some telegram channel or something like that. But the point is, is that there is a dialogue that will take place. And so Casino.org had an article that stated that Caesars seemed to have well worked out a deal. And their statement uh, says, and I'm going to quote two, two items from that article, the old we don't negotiate with terrorist strategy does make a lot of sense when there's insurance to reimburse $30 million in pocket change and you get to continue with business as usual. So a lot of inferences in there as well, for the particular author of that article. 
Another one that he had said is that, quote, our sources say Caesars Entertainment paid $15 million to the hacker to resolve its data breach. The original demand was $30 million. We are not making this up. Caesars talked them down like an episode of Pawn Stars. Now, again, to me, that's sort of poking the bear a little bit, and that's a result of normal business operation. Most ransomware operators will engage in a back and forth type of a communication to say, okay, fine, here's our initial demand, and here's how much we want, but you know, something's better than nothing. And if the organization has an effective strategy and it's thought through and they recognize that they have kind of a do not exceed level and they can basically back that up, you might end up kind of with something that everybody can live with. Kind of a strange way to look at things with regard to ransomware. Now, Lockbit, which is a ransomware group, according to VX Underground, they said they sent out a poll to their affiliates and they're considering implementing new rules because of the frustration with ransomware negotiators. And currently, the Lockbit ransomware group has no rules in place for how much or how little the affiliates can ransom a company for, and they're considering regulating the ransom demands. Now, this is from VX Underground's X post and things like that. And they say that newer affiliates are giving large discounts to victim companies out of desperation for money, but more experienced affiliates don't cave into that. So they've offered some different options for the affiliates to consider. Now, again, this is secondhand reporting, and I'm not on the Lockbit distribution list. Number one would be no change in payment policy. It's unregulated, and you just do what you want, kind of open market. The second one may be rules in place, which would set a minimum payment allowed to be 3% of the victim's company's annual revenue. Gee whiz, they're sounding like GDPR in the EU almost, with the option of a 50% discount, bringing it down to 1.5%. Okay, well, I don't even know if GDPR will negotiate with you, but most of those fines that I've seen come out of Europe, and again, I'm not likening the two to ransomware groups, don't get me wrong here, but I'm just talking that these are huge amounts of money. The third one is the rules that you can only go to 50% discount and or accept no discount. Or another one was you can go ahead and you will not go below the victim's maximum ransomware insurance policy. So there's a lot of these different things. And one of the divisions of Lockbit Ransomware Group, they call themselves the National Hazard Agency, interesting title. They said they'd immediately retaliate against any negotiator who approaches them with an offer of less than 3% of the company's revenue. And the retaliation would be complete destruction of company data. Okay, a lot of information there to digest. And again, it's secondhand. So I can't indicate whether or not that's reliable or not, but it's worth thinking about is that ransomware, whether you like it or not, is a business. And it's a very thriving business. It pays extraordinarily well. The smart operators are operating out of the reach of extradition of their victims' target countries. So that, to a certain extent, means you can enjoy your money as long as you don't go ahead and travel outside of your own country and go to places where you might get snagged. And because it's a business, they're going to reinvest some of those proceeds back into their technology. And so what we'll find then is like any good business, they'll have an R&D function and From that particular perspective, I think we can see that as long as ransoms are being paid, that the technology for ransomware is going to continue to improve. Now, Jason Rebholtz offered a succinct timeline on his LinkedIn page about the MGM attack. And so I said, I'm not going to go into details, but basically he pointed out that the threat actor put out about an 1100 word statement and it gave their unique perspective on the situation. And so this is kind of looking at the threat actor's timeline as as proposed there on Friday night or Saturday, the 8th or 9th of September, they gained access to the MGM resource by socially engineering the IT help desk into resetting a user account. Now, think about that for a moment. Do you have a help desk? Does your IT help desk? What's their job to do? Their job is to, well, help. And if somebody calls up and said, hey, I'm a user and I'm locked out, I need help getting in, I need a password reset or whatever, by and large, there are processes that should be in place to validate the identity of that user. But Many of the things that we might rely upon, does it sound like somebody you know? Do you happen to know somebody? Do you have some internal password or whatever? If that could be obtained or gained by an attacker, then that validation could be spoofed. And essentially, your help desk has just given out the credentials to attack your system. What's believed next is that threat actors gain privileges, got into the domain controllers, dumped credentials, cracked some, and then intercepted some passwords syncing between Okta and presumably Active Directory which is an interesting sub question there is that how are those passwords synced? Are they in the clear? Are they simple encrypted? Are they, how is that uh, encryption session set up as a fixed key? I don't know, but I think we're going to hear more from about that in the next couple months. And then after obtaining super user access to Octo and global admin in Azure, 
you pretty much control the environment. And of course, at that point, you have access to all the data you want. And the interesting thing was, is that some of the initial MGM containment efforts that were taking place seem to have taken place before any ransomware was initiated. And so as a result, it appears that the defenders did get a chance to make a move. But if the move were not complete, if it did not block absolutely everything, then it allowed the threat actor to continue with their process. And what I understand is they encrypted about 100 ESXi hypervisors. These are virtual machines, so who knows how many machines are down. And they put on a chat room and they tried to get somebody, but there's somebody lurking in there and they just wouldn't engage. And so the threat actor tried to get them engaged, get engaged, get engaged. And they went ahead and even posted a statement to set the record straight, claiming that some of the initial public statements that were made about them were inaccurate or were dismissive, saying, hey, in 10 minutes, you can hack a $30 billion company. That probably is not how it works. Just sure there's a lot of time and effort and resource that was put into this. And so one of the things we want to make sure is we don't get dismissive, that we recognize that on both sides of this equation, you have staffs that have a job and one side is offensive, the other side is defensive. And we often don't get to play the offensive side unless you happen to work for some three-letter agency or you have permission from a client to go ahead and work on the red team. But in this particular case, we find out then is that going through and looking at this is that the sophistication of the group makes it very hard. This is not a bunch of kids trying stuff out or downloading a kit and take a look at it. And so the goal is, is to understand what techniques were used, try to learn from them, update your security program to defend against this, okay? You're never going to have a perfect program. And for those people who want to go hate on one side or the other, let's face it, it's an ecosystem. For those of us who work in cybersecurity, if nobody made any mistakes, if there are no bad actors, if nobody ever did anything destructive, most of us would be out of a job. And so as a result, the presence of threat actors in our ecosystem is going to be something that in a way is going to be there. You just accept that, but also recognize that uh, it's kind of justifies what it is that you do. Now, that said, the goal here is to up our game. You may not defeat every single attack, but your goal is to make them work really hard to be able to go ahead and gain something from that perspective. Now, Mandiant, who always puts out great information, recently re released a report documenting the tactics and techniques. And these are the things that were used by the threat actor, UNC 3944. You know, okay, we've already talked about that, a scattered spider. And they primarily work in SIM swapping attacks for credential attacks. Now, back in the mid-2023, this year, they began deploying ransomware, kind of a different approach instead of just doing the SIM swapping. And their initial targets were telecoms, business process outsourcers, PPOs. But now they include hospitality, retail, media, entertainment, and financial services. Now, think about your resistance to the following items as I go through this uh, little excerpt from the Mandiant Report. And if they seem like weak spots in your strategy, pause, write this down, take a note, and then look into strengthening them. This group relies heavily on social engineering to obtain initial access to its victims. They frequently use SMS phishing campaigns and calls to victim help desks in an attempt to obtain password resets or multi-factor bypass codes. Number two, the threat actors consistently use legitimate software, including a variety of remote access tools the actors have downloaded from the vendor websites. Well, what does this mean? It means that if you're relying upon software hashes or being able to go ahead and do an allow list of software and somebody's running something PowerShell that's going to pass that test, then the hard part is you're not going to detect malware in the environment because utilizing existing tools that may already be present, you kind of live off the land, you might find out, hey, there's already scanner tools here. There's already uh, tools for managing endpoints. There's already an Azure console, there's Intune, and we've got control over it. Why not use it? that your ability to detect the adversary is not going to be the presence of new software or unusual software, but it's the behavior. Third one, once obtaining a foothold, this group often spends significant time searching through internal documentation, resources, and internal chat logs to figure out how to escalate privileges and maintain the presence within the victim environments. Now, that's kind of interesting to say that it's not a smash and grab, although we'll find out in the next sentence that they've moved very quickly. So what we find then is the dwell time, the amount of time in which a threat actor stays in an environment could be exceptionally long. It could even be months. And during that time, as they sit back there very quietly lurking, observing and things such as that, there is a potential opportunity for you to detect them and kick them out. 
but yet many organizations end up suffering significant breaches and only in retrospect do we find out that that presence had existed for quite a long time. So here's an interesting thought question. Let's assume that right now there is a threat actor that's present in your environment and they've been present no less than two weeks. All right, let's just accept that as a null hypothesis. Prove me wrong. How would you do that? How would you prove that wrong? Well, one of the things you might want to do is you might want to look at persistent connections. You also want to look, for example, at taking a look at all of your privileged actors. You go through and take a look at the number of global administrators you have in your Azure environment in uh, Active Directory. You're only supposed to have no more than five, but we've got a big organization. We need a lot of them. Okay. Well, even if you do and you go against best practice, do you have multi-factor authentication enabled? And I'm going to get into some ideas on MFA in a couple minutes to help you think more about it. Now, the fourth one that they had was the threat actors operate with an extremely high operational tempo, accessing critical systems, and exfiltrating large volumes of data over the course of a few days. The tempo and volume of systems that this group accesses can overwhelm security response teams. Now, that's an interesting thought. Can your adversary stand up a better capability for doing an attack than you can defend in terms of drawing on resources? Because we all have potential surge capabilities, but when was the last time you tested them? You have your organic teams. You may also have your incident response team. And you probably have a third-party contract with an organization that you can call and say, hey, it's in place. Well, it's kind of late to try to figure out the terms and conditions and get that through your legal department and have them dot the I's and cross the T's and can we change happy to clad? Because you're already in a hurt locker at that yeah. point. And so one consideration is to go to organizations that offer incident response and either pre-negotiate a contract or get on a retainer, recognizing that when you pay a retainer, that company may receive something and not do anything. But what it does guarantee you then is, if you will, head of the line privilege as compared to a widespread attack, which takes out multiple operators. And then you call them up and said, I'd like to be a new customer. Can we start now? And they say, we're kind of busy with our existing paying customers, but we'll get to you eventually. Okay, that doesn't sound too good. And now you sort of failed in your ability to bring in that extra capability. Now, if you are a Microsoft shop, take a close look at that Mandian article. It provides some specific recommendations with some screenshots, which help you find if you're on the right place. They don't give you the links directly. I like to do that when I have help. So I say, here, click here, click here, click here. But if you got a good sysadmin, they'll understand what we're talking about. About how to configure Entra ID, which is used to be called Microsoft Azure Active Directory. And I think we're always going to call it Active Directory for a while, but Entra ID is sort of the real new name. And they have some recommendations like removing SMS as an MFA verification. All right, no text messaging, just remove it. It's not allowed. Number two, restricting MFA to Microsoft Authenticator with number matching. You probably all know what that is. Microsoft has pushed that out, that when you get a challenge, it's not just, hey, pick one of three numbers, or is that you? Yes, it's me. But rather, they'll say, hey, there's a number on your computer screen. Enter that two-digit number on your mobile device. And oh, by the way, look at the map and see if you see where you're at. Now, I happen to be in Madrid right now. And yet, when I come in through my phone, which is through a U.S.-based telecom, it shows my point of presence in Texas. So sometimes those identity locations will not match. Make sure your users understand that. Now, if it happens immediately when you do your MFA and you realize that, hey, I'm on a U.S. phone company and I'm overseas on roaming, they're going to not pay to go through the public networks to get to the U.S. They're going to go backhaul on their own private lines. And that's why your point of presence shows up in the geography for Microsoft. Also, my experience has been is that IPv6 geolocation has been very problematic and therefore, if you're on IPv6, you might not get that. But otherwise, most of the time, I can kind of zoom in and see where am I, and it works pretty well for that. The third one is to create a custom authentication strength that includes only the password plus the MS authenticator with push notification. Okay, well, that means that we are not going to allow lots of other ways to authenticate in. We require everybody to have a password and the Microsoft authenticator. And then put all that in a conditional access policy and make all your users use it. Okay. Now, there's another recommendation they have to make sure that the MFA, multi-factor authentication, and the self-service password reset registration is from a trusted network location. Now, I've got a lot of pushback on that, by the way, from some technical people saying you can't do that, particularly if you have deployed employees or people are out of the office or things like that. Now, one of the things I like to see, and maybe it's there and it's just my lack of detailed knowledge about that. And so if you know this, go ahead and put, you know, give me a reply in the, in the show. 
But I'd like to see device compliance as an optimum as well, especially for remote employees. So I'm either from a trusted network location, you're at headquarters, or you have a fully compliant device, which is registered into and says everything's up to date and it's one of our devices. Then I'll let you go ahead and register from that. That's what I'd like to do. Now, don't forget to exclude your emergency access account. You do have one of those, right? Because if everything goes south completely, including, or what if your chosen cellular provider goes down and you need to log in as a global admin or any other administrator to get something done and nobody can complete MFA, you're stuck. And so what you want to be able to do is have one account that can gain global admin access with only a password. Now, what you want to do is you want to name that account, pick some fictitious name or something like that. So it just blends in with everybody else. Make it so that user doesn't show up in the directory when you look for everybody. So nobody's going to say, hey, who is that person? Let me email them. By the way, don't assign a 365 account to that address. That account should never have email. And now exempt it from all your MFA policies. You now have a global admin account that's accessible with only a password. And you're thinking in the back of your mind, Andrew Will Robinson, this is a horrible idea. But let me tell you, it might be your only way to back in. So how do we go ahead and compensate for that risk? So what's the maximum password length today in Microsoft? 156 characters. Now, I don't suggest that you do that for your everyday work, but if you're going to set up an emergency access account, I recommend a minimum 100 character password. Seriously, because this is something, and don't record this electronically. You write it down, you've got it on a piece of paper, it's in an envelope, it's signed, it's in a, a sealed location. You have to um, go ahead and get into the network room and maybe like we used to do uh, in the military, when you had very sensitive stuff, you had a safe inside a safe. And some people had the combination of the outside. Some people had the combination of the inside. You need one of each to be able to access it, whatever you're going to do. But now you set it up so any login to that account also sets off alarms all over the place. Now what you've got then is the ability to completely lock down your environment and yet still have that emergency access key. So that's a little lesson learned that I have found out in doing some research. And it's something you might want to consider as well if you have not done so in your environment. Now, Rachel Toback, who's the CEO of Social Proof Security, explained in her LinkedIn post that the MGM attackers claim they use one of the easiest ways to breach a company, a method that she often uses in her hacking. You look up who works at an organization on LinkedIn, you call the help desk by spoofing a phone number, and you tell the help desk, I lost access to my work account and I need help get me back in. Now, a lot of companies, and again, these, this is her observations, and I think they're excellent ones, most companies focus on email-based threats and their technical tools and protocols, and they're not yet equipped to deal with social engineering prevention protocols to catch and stop a phone attack like that. And so teams need protocols to verify identity before taking action. So the first teams that she goes after when she's on a hacking assignment for social engineering are basically what? People who deal with people's requests all the time, IT, help desk, customer support. This is a normal behavior. Pretend to be an internal teammate to convince them to give them access. Any information you can you can talk about the lunchroom, something, anything. You might get pictures on social media, do your homework, but start with phone attacks because they work pretty quickly. And then here are the questions that she poses to ask internally to your team to see if they're prepared to catch this attack. Do the folks who handle requests from team or customers use identity verification protocols? Hey, what's your name? What's your employee number? Okay, you need more than that. Maybe date of birth. Oh, I'm sorry, that's public information. A lot of stuff is out there, public information. Now, one of the things we used to do in the Navy is we used to have a duress security alert code. I don't think I'm giving anything away. This It's not classified. But what we did on our ship is that from time to time, you'd have somebody who comes up to the quarter deck and you need someone to come down there. And you'd say, Petty Officer Jones, you know, report to the quarter deck or report to this birthing compartment, report to engineering or whatever it happens to be. Well, we had a fictitious sailor who didn't exist. And everybody was supposed to know or at least the security teams knew that that didn't work. So if the word gets passed, like Senior Chief Nicholson, report to you know the you know chain locker, something like that. What does that mean? Well, the Senior Chief Nicholson who doesn't exist is an alert to the security teams, and the location is where the problem is. It's probably where the actor is. And so if somebody's on the ship or someone's holding a gun to the person's head that's sitting there on the microphone on the one MC. Uh, they're not going to necessarily know what's going on. And the whole idea is you have that duress word. So you want to get a duress word put out. I'm really concerned now, of course, with the ability for deep fakes. And not only do you need to have tons and tons of information, like my podcast have put out hundreds of hours of information so you can see what I look like and what I sound like. But even if there's only a little 10-second clip, it seems that they're able to simulate well enough for a human to say, 
that's her or that's him and things like that. So have some knowledge that you only know. And if you want a good way to think about it, go back and look at one of the early Star Trek episodes from the 1960s and have a chess move or something. The second one is that do we rely on knowledge-based authentication? You know, does a caller ID match in the system, et cetera? But there could be multiple ways to check that. And as your IT or help desk compensator promoted on the speed of saying yes to requests, do you incentivize time for security protocols and support? Then how do you identify, verify identity? So these are things that she recommends, and I think they're excellent ones. So if you're not familiar with her company and things such as that, I want to go ahead and, and take a look at social proof security. Now, Retool is a company which offers component libraries, workflow automation, et cetera, and they suffered a recent breach. They're not a casino, by the way, but they discuss their concerns with MFA and their blog entitled, When MFA Isn't Actually MFA. Hmm. Now, in that particular case, the attacker used an SMS phishing attack. They claimed to be an IT person. It said there might be a problem with your payroll and to please click on this link. So they're able to get the number of phone numbers for employees phone directory, something like that, and went out and sent out an SMS attack to all these people. Now, one and only one employee fell for it. But you know what? That's enough. The attacker captured their credentials. They called back using a deep fake, plenty of software out there you find, to sound like a known IT person, and they coaxed out an MFA code. Said later that the employee felt a little bit, it just doesn't sound right, but they gave it up anyway. Now, if your spidey sense is tingling when a call just doesn't seem right, you got to be careful. Somebody calls you and asks you for stuff. I get that that happens all the time. I get, I get calls from, you know, bank. Well, we need to verify you're you. Can you give us this, this, that? I said, no, you called me. And they're like, come to a hard stop. It's like, no, if I call you, you can verify who I am. But if you call me telling me you're my bank and you know a couple things about me or my account and you're not going to go ahead and give me detail, don't ask me for public information. I hate stuff like that. I don't think bank would say, you know, did you own this particular car or did you have this particular mortgage? He says, no. Why don't you ask something that only I would know? What was your bank balance on the 30th of June, 2021 for this account? Okay, if I have old records, I can go dig it out or something like that and figure out something that only the two of you would know. Nonetheless, once the attacker was able to go ahead and get that MFA code from that legitimate user, they added their own device to the victim's Okta account. Well, it turns out in that particular company, they were using G Suite. Well, once you're in the Okta account, you've enabled G Suite, which now links to the Google Authenticator via their new synchronization feature. Boom. All the one-time password creds are owned. Now, from there, just log in as administrator, take over the accounts by changing emails, resetting passwords, and do whatever you like. Now, here's their point of that particular blog entry, and I think it's an excellent one. And so Here's their statement. The fact that Google Authenticator syncs to the cloud is a novel attack vector. What we had originally implemented was multi-factor authentication. But through this Google update, what was previously multi-factor authentication has silently, at least to administrators, become single-factor authentication because control of the Okta account led to control of the Google account, which led to control of all the one-time passwords stored in Google Authenticator. Think about that for a minute. It's how you integrate your tools. And so if you're using a single sign-on type of a solution or whatever, you have to really think about how you go ahead and maintain that gate and what you couple that to. Now, what can we learn from all this? If you have single-factor authentication in your environment or a system, that's so 1990s, okay? If you're still doing that, you're asking for trouble. Shame on you. You need to get MFA on everything. Now, multi-factor, which in my humble opinion, 99% of the time is two-factor, right? But we call it multi-factor because it sounds better. It's orders of magnitude better, but it still has some vulnerabilities. Now, there's four types of authentication, if you remember that. Something you know, password. Something you have, like a key. Something you are, biometrics. And some place you are, a geolocation. And what we do is you want to pick not two or three or four out of the same category, but we want to get one from multiple things. If you've worked in very sensitive environments, highly classified environments. I've used some places three and even four types of authentication. Basically, you've got to get one from each. And now that means your false positive can go to pretty much zero. Now, some MFA techniques are more secure than others. So let's think about it real quick of what you're using. Let me walk through some potential vulnerabilities. How about SMS verification? Well, that's great. We just send you a six-character message or sometimes characters if you're a certain bank that I use. 
But guess what? That's still vulnerable to a SIM swap. Well, what's a SIM swap? Basically means that somebody has called up the phone company and socially engineered them to saying, hey, I lost my phone or I bought a new phone or whatever, and I'm really such and such. And they do a little bit of research on you so they can answer some of those initial query questions and say, okay, this is my new phone. Here's my new SIM. Can I get my phone number there? So those SIM swaps were good attacks early on in the crypto world where people would lose millions because that was the only way that they could protect their accounts and things like that. Now, here's the interesting thing. Do you have a complex code word on your mobile account? If you, someone were to call up your mobile provider and they say, hey, I'd like to change my phone number to a new device or whatever, they'll say, well, what is your special challenge word or whatever? And even if you set that up, call them up and try to get around that. Try to convince them that I don't have the challenge word, but it's still really me and see what, what process they do. There is an old 1964 black and white movie called Failsafe. And if you've never seen the movie, you need to go look the thing up. And it's, it actually deals with the same thing in that without giving away the plot too much. But it turns out that some American bombers are dispatched heading off toward the Soviet Union. There is a damage to some of the validation verification equipment on the aircraft. And these fail-safe methods are now being triggered. How do we go ahead and call them or recall them and things such as that? And it does have an interesting ending. But again, I'm not going to spoil it for you. The other question is, does your SMS come directly to your cell phone? Or do you run it through a redirected number like a Google Voice? Well, there's a new attack vector over there. I can't get to the phone company, but maybe I can get to Google Voice, or maybe I can get to some other soft phone in terms of that, in terms of forwarding. So there is some concern with SMS verification, and I'd be careful with that. Number two is the email token. Great, we just email you something. Well, again, it's the same vulnerability. Similarly, account takeover particularly if the email account is only protected by a single factor, like a password. So again, you want to think about if I'm trying to protect my multi-factor, I want to protect my multi-factor with a multi-factor. Sounds sort of like circular logic, but if I'm going to use a weaker MFA, I need a stronger MFA on the front end. So what do we tend to do? The time-based one-time password. We hear that TOTP acronym, and it's the grandchild of Security Dynamics who first patented this idea back in 1984. And we've considered this to be a superior approach where you basically get the app and it changes every 60 seconds or 30 seconds, depending on the period that you want and things like that. We've often considered that to be superior, but that retool blog I covered has me rethinking this a little bit because you find out that maybe there is a way around that. Now, biometrics are considered foolproof, at least by their own vendors, but I've been able to demonstrate how to defeat biometrics in a highly classified implementation uh, with permission, of course. Uh, but if captured by an opponent, that biometric data, copy your fingerprint, voice print, face print, whatever, you can't change that or patch it. You can't say, can you reissue me a face? Can I patch my left index finger or my, my right? Also, if you're using that on your cell phone, what's the concern with biometrics on a cell phone? Well, if a physical attacker grabs you and says, hey, Louis, hold his arms back, takes the phone out of your pocket, holds it to your face, it unlocks. Okay, let's go ahead and empty out these financial accounts. There's not much you can do about that. So, you know, you could forget about it. And of course, if there's some dress things, I think Apple added it a few years ago, what, the five clicks on, on the volume button or on the power button, something like that. But the whole idea there is, is that I don't like to use biometrics on things. Plus, who knows where the biometrics are going? Now, the one thing about fingerprints is that, and again, I, don't, I have to look into the facial stuff, but at least on fingerprints, they don't store the fingerprint. Okay, it's a hash. It's a one-way transform. And so you can't regenerate fingerprints. So it's interesting when I hear, these lawsuits that are saying, well, this company is being sued because of the lack of privacy, because the company had fingerprints for doing your time cards or whatever, and they didn't think. You can't steal that data and do anything with it. All it is, it's the result of a hash to say, yes, does it matter? But nonetheless, it's out there. But think carefully about putting biometrics on your devices. And then there's security questions, like what's your dog's maiden name? But many will default to public information, the questions that is, that can be scraped from social media. For example, what town did you grow up in? what city were you born or things like that, or socially engineered out of somebody. Have you ever seen those Facebook quizzes that ask you to reach some silly answer by typing in your mother's name, name, your hometown, the month of your birth, the last four digits of your social, whatever they happen to be, and oh, you get to say, da, 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 da. well, come on, think about it. All right, it's more than entertainment, but it's rather brilliant. So, so what's left? Hardware security keys. Now, there's no password to fish, no code to capture, no... Somebody to social engineer at a telephone company, no email to hack. Now, of course, if the attacker can physically steal the key, yeah, that's another issue. But there are locking keys that do require some sort of a pin to activate, and they will self-destruct 
after a number of failed attempts. Then you got to be careful that you're dealing with the denial of service. You better have a way to get things back, particularly if you're doing things like protecting software walls and stuff like that. So you want to pick your MFA method based on your perceived risk, your budget, and user acceptance. And in my opinion, probably in that order. Okay, so let's wrap up. We've been talking a lot about initially on the casinos and some of the hacks they took place. And again, props to those who are there working the defenses. They're working very, very hard. The fact that they got hit is not necessarily a mark against them, but it's hopefully would be a strong encouragement to their executive leadership team to better fund and better support what it is they're doing. And so that they're able to go ahead and put in better precautions. We'll find out that the threat actors that are doing this, if they are wise, they will reinvest some of the proceeds that they uh, capture and make better tools. So if we fix everything here, it doesn't end the game. It's just going to up it to a new level. And uh, then you just, one of those things where you just hope you're not the first person to discover the new minefield by stepping into it. But I did spend a lot of time talking about MFA. And that I think is really, really important as we go on from single factor to multi-factor. And then we looked at the different types. There's a better way to do it. And you might want to think about cost, user acceptance, they said, but most importantly, your risk environment. And for the really, really sensitive stuff, it's probably worth spending a little bit more. It, there's enough targets out there that we're not going to put anybody out of business on the other side. We're just going to find out somebody who's a little bit easier hit. But it's sort of like the old joke about the two hunters out there in the tent when I hear some rustling outside and he starts to put his boots on. I said, what are you doing? I said, there's a bear out there. I'm putting my boots on. He says, you can't outrun a bear. And the guy says, I just have to outrun you, right? So you got to be a little bit faster than the next one. If you're able to do that, then you're able to go ahead and protect your environment. And if you're able to do so, then hopefully you're not going to end up both feeding the bear as well as being a victim that ends up in the press and having to deal with all the impact that that takes place, both for your career, as well as for your organization and your customers and all the people that work. So I hope you found something of value in this episode. And I thank you for taking your time. If you're following us on LinkedIn, that's great because we do a lot more than just the podcast. We put out hopefully relevant information, as I say, a high signal to low noise ratio. So it's worth your time and effort. If you're listening to us on a regular podcast channel, awesome. Make sure you subscribe. If you're watching us on YouTube, then please go ahead and subscribe because that helps us get our numbers up, gets rid of unwanted ads, and it helps us serve you better. Share this with other people. Let them know where you're getting your good data. And I think you'll do better in your career. So hopefully we've helped you with your CISO tradecraft. And until next time, this is your host, G. Mark Hardy. Stay safe.